Good morning, my name is Rich and I'm one of the leaders here at the Slade and a very warm welcome to our service this morning. And can I say a particular hello if we've not met since you've only found the Slade since lockdown began. Uh, we'd love to hear from you and, and perhaps give you more details of what we're still doing as a church during this period. There's a link uh, to a form beneath this video where you can do just that. But let's pray as we begin our time together. Father God, we thank you so much for this morning. We thank you for your word that can come to us in our homes. We thank you for the technology that has made this possible. But more than all this, we thank you for the Lord Jesus, who, who came down to earth to reveal yourself so that we might know you. Father, please, would you help us to see him so clearly this morning and meet with you and honour you through our time. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, we're going to sing. Uh, start by singing perhaps the most famous of hymns. It's so famous because it so wonderfully captures the message of Christianity, that it is all about grace. We're going to sing Amazing Grace. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a We have two opportunities today to get together with others in the church family on Zoom. First, straight after this, there's the usual virtual coffee. And then tonight at 8 p.m., we have our prayer and praise. If you haven't received the details for those and would like to join in, please do send me an email and I'd love to help you get on. Well, the next level of the relaxing of lockdown measures came into effect yesterday. And part of these measures allowed the possibility of churches having physical gatherings again. Now, the government has given extensive procedures to ensure the safe use 
of places of worship, which is a good thing, of course. However, the procedures are many and complicated. And combined with the complications raised by the soon-to-start building work here, the trustees have decided that any form of physical gathering at the Slade isn't feasible for the time being. Therefore, there will be no in-the-flesh meetings until September at the earliest. Now, it is really hard to say that to you, because I know that that is sad news. Uh, but let me assure you that we can't wait for the time when we can meet again in this newly refurbished room. And we are planning now for how we can do that safely as soon as is practically possible. You may have questions about this. And so on Wednesday at 8 p.m., a pre-recorded question and answer is gonna be posted on our website. And we'll be giving some more information about why this decision has been made. I'm gonna explain how we see the next few months playing out. And then also discuss what physical gatherings might look like when we are able to start them. Now, if you have any specific questions which you would like answered in the question and answer, then please email them to me by the end of Monday, and we will endeavour to cover as many of those questions as possible. But now, I'm going to hand over to Andy for our children's talk. Hi, boys and girls. Hi, grown-ups. My name's Andy. I'm the youth and children's worker at the Slade. I want to ask you a question today. Have you ever felt left out? Like you're on the outside of things and looking in. Maybe you've been in the playground once and some people are playing a great game and you really want to join in, but they haven't invited you. So there you are just watching while they're having a great time playing. Maybe there's been a party in your class and lots of people getting invited to this party, but you don't. And you're feeling really left out. Well, do you know what? There's someone in our story today who feels totally left out. But he's not going to stay that way. That's right. We're continuing our series thinking about why we need Jesus from Matthew's gospel. And today we're thinking about we need Jesus because we need a friend. First, we meet this man called Matthew. Now, he's doing all right for himself. It looks, things look good. Um, and he's quite well off. He's got quite a bit of money because he's a tax collector. But the thing is, being a tax collector in Matthew's day meant you were really on the outside. You didn't really fit in. And actually, people thought of tax collectors as big sinners. They'd done lots of bad stuff. And, and honestly, some of them had done bad things. They'd stolen people's money. Sometimes they weren't very kind and could be mean and could be greedy. Um, and so Matthew is really on the outside. And he's sitting there at his tax booth one day. And along comes Jesus. And Jesus simply walks up to him and looks him in the eye and says... Follow me. Two words. And the verse says that Matthew just got up, he left everything and went to follow Jesus. The next scene we're invited to is incredible. It's a party going on. I'm sure there were lots of lovely food and party treats. And um, I'm sure they maybe even had a bit of a dance and a sing, and they're having a great time. But outside this party, things started to kick off. Um, some Pharisees turned up, and they were not happy. They were like, hang on, hang on, who's that in that party? That's Matthew and his buddies. They're a bunch of sinners. And yet, look, look I mean, is that right? Yeah, that's right. Jesus is in there. They couldn't believe it. So they started to ask Jesus' disciples, why is Jesus in this party? Doesn't he know that these guys are all sinners? Jesus comes out of the party at that point out of the house he comes up to the pharisees and he says this it's not the healthy you need a doctor but the sick for i have not come to call the righteous 
but sinners. This is what the Pharisees had totally missed. Jesus had come to be a friend of sinners. He had come down to be friends with people just like Matthew. Not to leave them as sinners, but to say you are welcome in God's family. You're never going to get there by being like the Pharisees, by trying to be good. The only way is by being a friend of Jesus and by trusting in what he has done on the cross. Guys, this is good news for all of us because we're all sinners. We all need to be Jesus' friend. And Jesus says to us today, just like to Matthew 2,000 years ago, come, come follow me. What the Pharisees hadn't realised about themselves was that if they looked at their hearts, instead of sneering at others, they would see that they are just as much a sinner as Matthew was. And they needed to be Jesus' friend too. Guys, we're going to sing because it's such good news. We want to sing to this Jesus who is ready to be our friend, even though we're sinners. So get up on your feet. Let's have a little boogie and enjoy praising our King and our friend. Sending us his own son, Jesus died for us. God showed us his love when Jesus died for us. While we were his enemies, God showed us his love. How do we know what? Love is God showed us his love by sending us his own son Jesus died for us God showed us his love when Jesus died for us while we were his enemies God showed us his love by sending us his own son jesus died for us god showed us his love when jesus died for us while we were his enemies god showed us his love god showed us his love when jesus died for us Last week, we saw Jesus on trial in front of the Sanhedrin, uh, the religious leaders. And this week, we find him before Pilate, the Roman governor. And the reading is going to come from Mark 15, and it's going to be read by Kay, Caroline and Johanna. Good morning. We are reading from Mark 15, starting from verse 1. Very early in the morning, the chief priest with the elders, the teachers of the law, and the whole Sanhedrin made their plans. So they bound Jesus, led him away, and handed him over to Pilate. Are you the king of the Jews? asked Pilate. 
you have said so, Jesus replied. The chief priest accused him of many things. So, again, Pilate asked him, Aren't you going to answer? See how many things they are accusing you of. But Jesus still made no reply, and Pilate was amazed. Now it was the custom at the festival to release a prisoner whom the people requested. A man called Barabbas was in prison with the insurrectionist who had committed murder in the uprising. The crowd came up and asked Pilate to do for them what he usually did. Carrying on from verse 9. Do you want me to release to you the king of the Jews? Asked Pilate, knowing it was out of self-interest that the chief priest had handed Jesus over to him. But the chief priest stared at the crowd to have Pilate release Barabbas instead. What shall I do then with one you call the king of the Jews? Pilate asked. Crucify him, they shouted. Why? What crime has he committed? asked Pilate. But they shouted all the louder. Crucify him. Wanting to satisfy the crowd, Pilate released Barabbas to them. He had Jesus flogged and handed him over to be crucified. Carrying on from verse 16. The soldiers led Jesus away into the palace, that is the praetorium, and called together the whole company of soldiers. They put a purple robe on him, then twisted together a crown of thorns and set it on him. And they began to call out to him, Hail, King of the Jews! Again and again they struck him on the head with a staff and spat on him. Falling on their knees, they paid homage to him. And when they had mocked him, they took off the purple robe and put his own clothes on him. Then they led him out to crucify him. Next up, Fiona is going to lead us in prayer. And after that, we're going to sing King of Kings, a song where we remember that Jesus, the King of Kings, did not despise the cross, but went steadfastly to it in order to win salvation for his people. And then following singing that, Wes will preach. Father God, we thank you for your unchangeableness. We thank you too for your love and your grace to us. We thank you, Father, for our Queen and the way she's encouraged us through these last difficult months. We would pray, Father, too, for our government as they cope with the coronavirus situation, for wisdom for them, as they cope with the economy to try and get it back on track. We pray for those struggling because they've lost their jobs and are struggling to make ends meet. We know, Father, that the world was made by you. And as we look around, there is so much unrest. We pray for Hong Kong and the unrest there. And we pray for China too, that they would honor the agreement that was reached when they took Hong Kong over. We know, Father, that through all the troubles, you're working out your purposes and your purposes are good. And we marvel too how you often use your enemies in the working out of your purposes. We think of the unrest about racism too, Father, proclaiming that Black Lives Matter. We believe that too, Father. We believe that all lives matter and are precious to you because you made us in your image. And so, Father, we would pray for Wes as he brings your word to us, we pray that you would speak through him to hearts hungry for your word. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Talk. 
The contrast couldn't have been greater. We often say that, don't we, when opposites are on display. It was like men against boys. One minute the sun was out, the next it was pouring down. You should have seen these two houses and their gardens. One of them was like a scrapyard. The other one, you'd have thought it was the Chelsea Flower Festival. When opposites are placed together, They really do highlight the differences starkly, don't they? Here today in Mark 15, as we move towards the crucifixion of Jesus, we see this so starkly on display. We've got all this brutality and yet all this beauty. 
We've got all this hatred and yet all this hope. We've got all this wickedness, but all this wonder. Each week as we've been studying Mark, we've asked the question, who is this man, Jesus? Of course, we've seen that Jesus is like no man that ever lived. And today and in the next few weeks, we're going to see this magnified more than ever before. But as we look at Jesus and we see him as the one who is the one that we can put all our hope in. He is the one where all our help can be found. I hope we're going to take note and we really are going to fully understand who Jesus really is. But let's look at all these other characters around him today. First up, uh, note, it's a big group of them who we see very early in the morning there about their wicked business in verse 1. They've reached their decision that Jesus is guilty and so they take him to Pilate. Who, who is this? Well, as we saw last week, it's the chief priests, the elders, the teachers of the law, the whole Sanhedrin, all the Jewish top brass, the whole shabozzle. And what have they decided? That Jesus must die. This comes as no surprise. Mark's been preparing us for this moment right from chapter 3 verse 6 where we first read that they want and they plot the death of Jesus. So for nearly three years this is what they've craved. How incredibly long a time to harbour evil and hatred in their hearts. I'm sure you find like me that harbouring wrong thoughts even just for a day or so they do great harm to us. They, they rot our souls. But people do it, don't they? People do it for years, sadly. Friends, family. Uh, they, they won't speak. They refuse to reconcile with someone. But a couple of key things for us to notice. In Jesus seemingly being on trial here, I believe it's all the other characters that are actually on trial. It's their actions, it's their responses. And they're on trial before Almighty God, like we are as we live out our lives, by the way we respond to Jesus. And he knows and he sees as the ultimate judge of all. Next, you may have spotted some ultimate irony here. These religious leaders, with all their pomp, all their supposed power, they're pathetic and weak and although they found Jesus guilty of blasphemy according to their kangaroo court, they're utterly powerless to do anything because, of course, they're living in Roman-occupied territory. They need the Romans' permission. Their very own oppressors, who they loathe and despise, they need their help. So the very Messiah promised to their people to save them. They have no idea who he is, and instead they want him dead. Do you know who Jesus really is? Secondly, on to the stand to be tried without realising it is Pilate, the Romans appointed governor of the region. And just like the chief priests, Pilate only gets one question answered by Jesus. Jesus admitted to the religious leaders he was the Messiah. He admits to Pilate he's the king of the Jews. However, in the original, it indicates that as Jesus replies, he says it in such a way as, well, yes, that's one way of putting it, Pilate, but not king as you think. And remarkably, just like the religious leaders, Pilate has no idea of the identity of Jesus. And he's also utterly powerless. This is hilarious. He's the big, tough Roman governor in charge. And yet he's mere putty and a pawn in the hands of sovereign God who's in control of all that's happening here. Because look, he's even at the mercy of these Jewish people who comically he's supposed to be ruling over. While Pilate doesn't know who Jesus really is, he does know he's innocent. Look, verse 10, knowing that it was only out of envy and jealousy that he's been handed over. But he's caught between a rock and a hard place. Jesus won't answer him and all the accusations put to him. So he thinks and he comes up with a plan that he believes is ingenious. 
There is this custom at this special time of year that they will release a prisoner. And so he pitches Jesus against a terrorist. But even that doesn't work. They simply shout Pilate down. And note these wicked words about Pilate, verse 15. Wanting to satisfy the crowd, he has Jesus handed over to be flogged and crucified. In Proverbs 27, we read that you and I, all of us, we are tested by the applause and praise we receive off others. How many of us love to be popular? Early on in this uh, COVID crisis, a number of premiership football clubs decided that they would put all the non-playing football staff and coaching staff on furlough. So it included all the people, like those who worked in the canteen, on the minimum wage, who couldn't even earn in a lifetime what some of the players earn in a month. And yet there was this huge uproar. Former players, the press got hold of it, and they made this, made this massive U-turn because of pressure. Celebrities, politicians, they crave people's approval. You and I will identify it at times in our own hearts. I I want to be liked. It's only natural, isn't it? But when it's at the expense of compromising my faith, fearing people rather than God, like we saw Peter last week, denying that he even knew Jesus, shame on us. Have we missed or not taken opportunities to share our faith with friends, family, neighbours, work colleagues? Because of of a fear of what they may think? How tragic. While we can be quick to despise Pilate for his capitulation and his brutal nature, allowing the crowd to have their way, even knowing Jesus was innocent, I think we need to examine our own hearts, our own feeble, fickle hearts at times. Note how utterly powerless like we've already said again Pilate was and also totally ignorant of who Jesus's true identity is as he allows the the only innocent one there Jesus to be sentenced to death on a cross like a guilty criminal so Pilate had no idea who Jesus really was do you thirdly this man Barabbas Well, he's not on trial. He's already been found guilty and he's waiting his execution. If anyone was powerless here, it was Barabbas. Chained, waiting, imminent crucifixion. We read he was a murderer. He led a rebellion against the Romans. But now he's getting justice. But there's this custom, like we've just mentioned, at Passover. Even though the Jews are in captivity to their Roman rulers, they're granted by the Romans that one Jewish prisoner can be freed by popular choice. Pilate stupidly thinks Barabbas is not only a threat and an enemy to the Romans, but also because he's such an unpleasant, unsavory, scary character to the Jews, and they'll also want him dead. It was obvious, wasn't it? Mild-mannered Jesus, or brutal, mad Barabbas out roaming the streets again? How little does Pilate know of Jesus and what's gone on between him and the religious leaders and their crowd of followers. So unbelievably, the guilty Barabbas goes free. The innocent Jesus takes his place. But this is the message of Mark all along. Mark 10, 45, For even Jesus, the Son of Man, came not to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. This is not all about what's fair and what's right for Barabbas. This is about what God had planned all along. That the innocent one, Jesus, would die. So the guilty like Barabbas, the guilty like you and me, may go free. Imagine being Barabbas though and uh, the Roman soldiers walking towards his prison cell. He's unlocking it. However hardened a criminal he was, knowing that this was his time, this was when he was to be crucified. Surely he he was petrified. He'd have seen, witnessed 
how horrendous crucifixions were. And as the guard opens the door and looks at Barabbas with disdain, as he probably murdered one of his fellow soldiers, he almost spits these words out at this Roman soldier, this guard, to Barabbas. I have no idea why someone must be looking out for you, mate. But you're being released. What? Barabbas replies. Yeah, you heard me. You're being freed. Now get out. Surely Barabbas thought the soldier was messing with him. Some sick joke. Which would surely end in him being caught and crucified. But no, he's free. He really is free against all the odds. It's madness. It's impossible. It's a dream. It's mercy at its most impossible. Mercy at its most ridiculous. It's all because of the man Jesus. Who no doubt Barabbas, even though he may have heard of, had no idea who he really was. Imagine not knowing The one who taken your place willingly on death row. Do you know who Jesus really is? Fourthly, the crowd. Now, if we're looking for a glimmer of hope in in anyone, surely today it's the crowd. Especially as we've come across them a number of times before in Mark's gospel. They've been contrasted with the religious leaders, haven't they? Back in chapter 2, as the religious leaders sneer at Jesus for forgiving the paralysed man's sins. Uh, And then as Jesus heals the paralysed man, we read that the crowd praised God because they'd never seen anything like this before. Only a few chapters ago in chapter 11, when the religious leaders know that Jesus had spoken against them and want to arrest him, we read that they couldn't. Because the crowd all around were amazed at Jesus' teaching. In chapter 12, when Jesus called out the religious leaders again, they do nothing because we read in verse 12, they were afraid of the crowd. As he enters Jerusalem, of course, Jesus riding on a donkey. Who's there? The crowd shouting, cheering, saying, praise you, save us, Hosanna, as they throw their cloaks on the road and palm branches. Right, so the crowd loved Jesus, yes? And no, not this crowd, sorry. It's a different crowd from those Palm Sunday fans, maybe. Maybe one or two of them are the same. We we, we don't really know. But it probably seems as though it's a crowd that supported and followed all the religious bigwigs. What we do know is their scandalous choice over demanding Barabbas, a violent, murdering terrorist, be released and Jesus instead be crucified. Even though Pilate argues with them, but but this man's done nothing wrong. And they just scream him down, crucify him. This crowd don't recognise Jesus as their king. Again, they have no idea who Jesus really is. If only they did. But why did they demand Jesus to be crucified? Well, we see in verse 11, our answer, the chief priests, they've done a great job of going around, lobbying, stirring up, maybe threatening, I don't know, the crowd, and telling them to get, uh, ask for Barabbas to be released instead and Jesus to be crucified. And so everyone just goes along with the crowd. Is that how you live your life? Whatever, you want, whatever any, everyone else is into, you're into as well. I mean, something it never would have crossed your mind to be bothered with, but it's all the rage, it's all the craze now, and so, yep, yeah, you're in as well. They're all nameless, the crowd, but shameless. Pilate insists with them, but this man is innocent, he's done nothing wrong. Crucify him. Maybe one of the youngest in the crowd between screams of crucify him, crucify him. Uh, maybe they turned to their older sister and said, who, 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 is, who is this Jesus anyway? 
The crowd had absolutely no idea who Jesus really was. Do you? Fifthly, the soldiers. They certainly have no idea uh, that Jesus here is the sovereign creator of the universe. The one that could instantly call an army of angels just to exterminate them there and then. But no, they're oblivious to it and they're going to have their monstrous Roman soldiers fun with him. But they're also incredibly powerless. You see, this was all part of the Father's plan, as we've seen all along. This plan of salvation for Jesus to suffer like this. This was prophesied centuries ago that Jesus would be brutalised at the hands of men. God the Father actually allowed it, planned it for you and me. And so the soldiers come to him, King! King of the Jews, right, yeah. In case you hadn't realised, Jesus, King of the Jews, uh, us Romans are in charge. So what sort of king does that make you, Jesus? King of slaves, king of the peewees, king of the nobodies, king of the powerless, king of the captives. Pilate ordered that they start with flogging, which Roman historians record Uh, Many men died before they were crucified because of their uh, flogging. It was so horrific. They all shout out, Hail, King of the Jews. They find some old purple uh, cloth uh, and make it into a robe. Purple is an emblem of royalty, a symbol. And they get this crown of thorns. Oh, a king's got to have a crown. Hey, Brutus, toss over that crown. They ram together these thorns, thistles and... They ram it on his head as they spit at him and swear at him. And they reach out to give him a staff. Oh, oh, a king's got to have a a royal scepter. And yet instead they smash him over the head with it. No doubt laughing as they fall down in mock worship on their knees. How can humans behave so inhumanely to others? Especially someone who's utterly powerless, unable to defend themselves. Very easily, I'm afraid, as we still see today. Because our hearts are corrupt as humans. We're capable of anything when we live without the fear of God and the fear of his justice. Just think of that policeman, Derek Chavin who calmly, callously knelt on George Floyd's neck while he begged for his life, even with others watching and filming him. That policeman didn't say a word. He didn't stop. He didn't flinch. How? How? Because like the Roman soldiers, he obviously thought, I'm just doing my job. There's nothing wrong with my actions. I'm not going to be held to account for this. Obviously no dread or fear of God holding him to account. But before we're quick to judge others, God knows, God sees, God records all injustices, all wrong, all crimes and acts of brutality. And remember Jesus says that if we hate someone in our hearts, it's like committing murder. You see, it's no good us looking at the Roman soldiers and the way they treated Jesus in disgust when we don't examine our own hearts. We can look at others in society and see wicked things they do and yes, we must make a stand for justice, what's right. But not so that we're oblivious to our own faults and failings. While we may not have murdered anyone, We've surely harboured hatred and bitterness in our hearts. While we may not have been involved in any racist physical or verbal attacks, we may have had racist thoughts or been complicit by saying nothing uh, while a friend or family member shared a racist comment or joke. While never mocking or treating anyone like the soldiers treated Jesus, We may well have made fun of and mocked and gossiped about someone behind their backs, not feeling a pang of remorse. It's only a laugh, hey? 
The soldiers had no idea they were brutalizing the savior of the world. Do you really know and believe Jesus is the savior of the world? Your savior? Listen to this verse in the starkest of possible contrasts to everyone we've seen today here in Mark 15. From Romans. But God demonstrates his own love towards us. In that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. If you're a Christian... Why did Jesus die for you? Because he saw that you were going to live this innocent, perfect life in every way, thought, word and deed. No. Despite our sin, our rebellion, our selfishness and pride, he willingly came to die for us. But surely he didn't come to die for the people that we've seen today here in this chapter. Like the chief priests and Pilate and Barabbas, the crowd, the soldiers. Yes, remarkably, thankfully he did. How do we know that? Well, a couple of quick reasons. After Jesus has ascended, uh, only weeks later, the good news of Jesus is proclaimed. And many people we read of in the New Testament, just like the chief priests and soldiers, people like Pilate, Barabbas, the crowd, they wonderfully met Jesus Christ in a saving way and he had mercy on them. But we also know, I know personally, because he came to die for me. Even amazingly, despite, shamefully at times, my proud, angry, indifferent, hard, arrogant, mocking, men-pleasing, gossiping, complicit to injustice, heart. He still came for me. And offers me and all who cry out to him salvation and forgiveness. Jesus, despite seemingly being powerless here, was the only one with any power. Um, Ultimately, he used his incredible love and power to let himself be treated like this, even dying for those that treated him so. Who is this man, Jesus? He's the only one innocent, surrounded by all back then and by all today who are guilty. Who is this man, Jesus? He's the only one who came to die that we may live. Who is this man, Jesus? He's the only one in stark contrast to everyone and anything in the world that can save and rescue us. Hallelujah. What a saviour. Do you know him? Well, if you do, You're going to love singing this last song about the great, dying, precious love of Jesus. Let's sing together. Yeah. 
shall pierce the night and I will rise among the saints my gaze transfixed on Jesus face Oh praise the name of the Lord our God Oh praise His name forevermore for endless days That's the end of our service this morning, but do pop onto Zoom for our virtual coffee for a chance to catch up with others. And visit our website if you want to find more about the church. But as we close, let's pray. Father, we thank you for Jesus. We thank you for sending him. Lord Jesus, we praise you that you did not despise the cross, but that you went steadfastly to it in order to save people who, who didn't have a clue who you were, in fact, even to save those who are your enemies. We thank you for your astounding grace and pray that we would be trusting to you, clinging to you this week. In Jesus' name, amen.
against up the Lord Almighty? Who can stop the Lord Almighty? Who can stop the Lord Almighty? 